And it's Bourbon Blog Live here on a Wednesday night with our friend from Indiana, French Lick. It's the spirits of French Lick alchemist himself. It's Alan Bishop. How's it going, Alan? It's going great, man. It's good to see you. Hey, it's good, good to, to see you, you too. And and you have some, uh, we have some new bourbons that uh, you're going to, fairly new bourbons. You released these not too long ago, right? Yeah, a couple, mo a couple months ago. Yeah, yeah, roughly right in there. So, yep. That some new bourbons. We're going to be talking about the Matty Gladden and also the Lee W. Sinclair here in a moment. But uh, I think a lot of us, uh, you know, from this region know about French Lick, Indiana and Spirits of French Lick. But for those that might be uh, joining from across the world and, and maybe only heard a little bit about you, what what is the Spirits of French Lick? Yeah, so it's uh, we are one of like i think 30 something craft distillers in the state of indiana now uh which boggles my mind because if you went back to 2013 there was one making brandy and that was it uh right. we're not the largest but we're the largest pot still distiller in the state of indiana and we're absolutely in love and fascinated by the pot still and, and the abilities that it has the capabilities that it has um so we're an outgrowth of the french lick winery uh, we are there in Springs Valley. We're actually on the West Baden side. Of course, West Baden and French Liquor are kind of twin towns. They're butt up right, right next to one another, right? Um, so we uh, we started distilling in April 2016. Prior to that, I was down at uh, Copper and Kings. I was there for a couple of years, and and uh, I'm a Hoosier at heart, man. I, I came from this side of the river, despite my family all coming from Kentucky. Uh, I, I really enjoyed my time over there, you know, at Copper and Kings, but I knew I wanted to get back on this side of the river. Uh, right. and, and do my thing over here because there's so much deep distilling history here that nobody knew about. And that's important to me. Uh, I wanted to come over here and play and, and, you know, sort of rebuild the distilling history over here on this side of the river and not just be a distiller, but also maybe be a little bit of a historian alongside of it and just make good quality products that are a little differentiated from what you can find elsewhere. Absolutely. Your products are, are incredible, Alan. And, uh, you, you, you have many titles we were just talking about. Many people say, uh, Master Distiller, you, you like to go by Alchemist. Why, why is that? Why, 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 is, why the term Alchemist? There's probably some strange fascination with Gargamel from the Smurfs from when I was a kid. But <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, yeah. Right. But really, it's uh, I always tell people, so I, I love what I do. I'm very passionate about what I do. I love learning about distilling and all the things associated with it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just jumped off of a podcast interviewing Justin Dean from Madhouse Vinegar about vinegar because vinegar interests me. It's cool. It's parallel to distilling, right? Yeah. So for yeah. me, there is no such thing as a master distiller. And I don't mean that as any kind of slight against anyone in the industry, but you can take the most seasoned veteran distiller out there and they may be master distiller of their distillery. But if you took a bourbon guy and you dropped him into an old Soviet bloc country and gave him a plum tree and a pot still and said, make me a world-class Slivovitzia, they may or may not know what Slivovitzia is. They may or may not know where to start at, but they're certainly not going to master it the first nine or ten times because they have never considered how that art form might in some way inform their art form in some other way. They're different disciplines, but they all inform one another or they can inform one another. Right. So I always say, so, if you know, if, if I'm gonna go, if I'm gonna go pretentious, I'm not gonna go master distiller. I'm going full on alchemist, just completely pretentious as much as possible. <laughs> You're gonna go all the way to alchemist. I like it, and you definitely are a, a, a real pro. And and so much science behind what you do, and uh, with the research, the history, uh, the history of uh, of Indiana really does come up to play in a part of, of what you do there at Spirits of French Lake too, right? It definitely does. We, um, we're it's Jolie Casper's act, my, my VP of marketing. We're, we're big on hashtags. Obviously that's a huge thing nowadays with social media, you know? So I use an old, uh, I use a hashtag that's based off an old Rocky Erickson song. Um, and it's a hashtag. If you have ghosts, you have everything. So, uh, <laughs> spirits of French spirits of French lick is not just the spirits mm -hmm. in the bottle, but it's the spirits of the place. And so everything is, it's very much about building up that history building off the existing distilling history and then paying tribute to individual characters from Indiana history, not so much as a marketing thing as the fact that it is that we love history. And listen, I could write a blog about all these historical characters and maybe I'd have 10 people that read it. But if I make a product that matches their personality and then I write about them on the bottle, that gets your attention a little bit more. You know, you can sit down right. with it and maybe come to, to understand it. Of course, being on this side of the river, you know, 
we don't we don't necessarily have a lot of gatekeepers over here. You don't have you know you Mike Veach, uh, 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 Fred Minnick. You know when we first started, there was nobody. So if you're going to distill and you're going to be in Southern Indiana, or as we call it, Hoosier occupied Northern Kentucky, uh, you know you've <laughs> got to kind of be the historian yourself. You know you've got to be able to build that history, or else everybody goes. Well, they're on the wrong side of the Magic River to do anything good. So, right. Right. no, it's so important what you've done for for both whiskey spirits and for Indiana. Uh, a lot of fans we see joining us just want to give a shout out. Donald Snyder uh, joining us from Florida, saying we're big fans of French Lick uh, uh, Distillery. Uh, also, Tom Greener uh, is a big fan too. My whiskey den. A lot of good people joining us. Aaron yes, Hardeman. Yeah. So many people, the Daily Ash, thank you all. So many good people that, that are aware of what you do and that um, probably have helped you over the years and, and visited you. And um, Definitely. Uh, this, again, these these bourbons we're about to try, folks, are brand new. So if you're watching, uh, definitely like this, share this, retweet, share on Facebook. We always appreciate that on Bourbon Blog. And um, these are amazing spirits. Which one Which one do we want to begin talking about or any any order you want to go in? Uh, so I would start probably with the Sinclair. And the only reason I say that is it's a, it's a little lighter style of bourbon. Yeah. And, um, while it's a good yeah. story and I'll give you the story, it's not as good of a story as the Maddie Gladden is. So <laughs> okay, uh, we're going to work up to the story. Yes. yes. It's, it's, it's going to be a good, this, now this character, looking at this character, I would think this, this guy looks like a real character. Um, <laughs> this is how, how, who is this guy? Who who is the Lee W. Sinclair? I maybe I should know from Indiana history, but I may be forgetting. Ow, oh, it's all good. So Mr. Sinclair was, I believe, a native originally of uh, Greene County, Indiana. His father owned a textile mill up in Chicago and was a fairly well-known businessman. Uh, Sinclair married and moved here to Washington County, Indiana, which is where I live at, and he uh, he built himself up in the textile industry. Inherited his father's uh, his father's industry. Uh, started a huge textile mill in Salem, Indiana, which is right up the road from us where I was born at. And uh, he eventually worked up to being the a, a, a stock owner as well as the president of the New Albany and Salem state, state banks, which is pretty impressive. Uh, he was actually a descendant of the, the Scottish Sinclairs. Uh, so he was raised, you know, within Freemasonry and within some of the secret so societies at the time, the Knights of Pythias, et cetera, and had a real interest in that stuff. Uh, traveled Europe. Lost his first wife fairly early on in the 1870s uh, to cholera, unfortunately. Um, but the long and short is after the the railroad, the New Albany and Salem Railroad, later became the Monon, really started getting going here in southern Indiana. He saw French Lick as this sort of opportunity, right? So the whole of French Lick in West Baden is just swampland. If it yep. were not for the casinos and the hotels and the unique groundwater that's there, there'd be nothing in French Lick. And that, that's not a knock against it. I love the place. But right. he went and he bought an old hotel over there and, and saw it as an opportunity, ran it for a couple of years, and it burned down. And Lee was just sort of put off by the whole thing, so he's going to get out of it. But his daughter, Lillian, whom he loved dearly and would have done anything for, she talked him into getting back into it. And he said, all right, if I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it the right way. I'm going to put in a hotel and a casino, game room, as they called it at that time, uh, the likes of which nobody's ever seen in the United States before. We're going to call it the Carlsbad of America, and uh, <laughs> we're going to we're going to throw in the uh, the largest freestanding dome in the entire world. Uh, I don't care if it can't be built. I'm going to find somebody that can build it, and I'll be damned. He found a 23 year old engineer that could build it, and they did it, and it was the largest freestanding dome in the world for 70 plus years. But, that one was for 70 years the largest. Yeah. Yeah, it, and he talked to multiple engineers, and they told him there's no way it could happen. But so we knew that we wanted to name something after Sinclair because Sinclair, of course, being you know businessman here in my town, traveling over to Orange County next door to go do business over there, you know, there nothing would exist in town. It all started with Sinclair. Really, we're right ac across from the dome, and we're on Sinclair Street, so it makes sense that we'd want to pay tribute to him. So. This mash bill is kind of interesting. It's an alternative four grain mash bill. And I know there's some more four grains out there nowadays. They tend to be right. wheat and rye together, um, which to me doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. Um, so this mash bill is actually something I came up with when I was a teenager, for better or worse. I grew up in a family of distillers, legal and illicit. So uh, when I was about 15, I got tangentially involved. Grandpa and dad helped me build a little 10 gallon still. And uh, basically gave me two rules. Don't blow yourself up in the backyard and bring us something that's worth drinking. So 
I knew all the things that they did, <clears throat> obviously, but I knew that they didn't use oats. And I thought, well, why not throw some oats in there? And this was the first thing, first Mashville I ever put in front of them uh, was this Mashville. It was a sugar shine at the time. Now, obviously, it's a cooked grain, uh, but it stuck with me throughout my career. And so it being from Washington County, me being from Washington County and Lee living in Washington County, it made sense that we would put his name on there. He was also a pretty refined man. So, you know, he, he would have definitely appreciated a good whiskey. But I also think that he would have understood the aesthetic of a little lighter style bourbon whiskey that's pot distilled, double pot distilled with no chill filtration, number two char oak barrels opposed to a three or a four. And he would have seen the similarities between that and maybe a fruitier style of scotch or even some brandy like similarities with some of the stone fruit that's there and some of the sweetness in the mouthfeel that's there. Yeah, this is so good. I mean, and again, this is uh, first of all, really cool that you created this like back when you were a teenager. This is a recipe you came up with. Uh, have had ready to make someday and then what's that feel like I mean to know that you created this when you were just beginning to sort of get your feet wet in the distilling world and then as a grown-up you can share this I mean that's that's really special <laughs> well Tom I'll, I'll, I'll tell you two things about that that are kind of interesting so I grew up in a family of tobacco farmers and distillers so I tell people I was yeah. kind of born in device <laughs> right and for me <laughs> when I was a kid none of it was any fun you know, it didn't become fun until much later on until my right. mid-20s, whatever. But the second part of that that I will tell you is that as far as talent goes, there's really two things I could be doing. And it's either distilling whiskey or digging ditches. So every day that I wake up and I get to go make whiskey for a living is a little bit of a blessing. And it's a little bit like, oh, is this actually happening at this point in time that you get to go do this and people like it and people enjoy it? Uh, the fact that there's a recipe that's involved that goes back to my teenage years, uh, you know, to me, I think that's the neatest thing in the world. And yeah, you know, historic, historically building up Sinclair and then also building up the use of oats in pot distilled bourbon. Because if you go back to prior to the introduction of the low rectification column still in Kentucky, prior to industrialization, you will find that a lot of distillers were using either oats or oat malt in bourbon. And so... Some people who taste the Lee Sinclair, you know, it's a little outside the realm of normal bourbon drinking. And they, right. they think it's, oh, that's not quite bourbon. Well, at one point in time, it definitely was. All we have done is reintroduce that concept to people. So it's it was there a long time ago and now it's coming back. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's exactly. it's really a great it, the great mouthfeel, uh, really soft. Uh, there's some nice like butteriness to this kind of a buttery creaminess. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe this beautiful. I get a slight hint of, of peanut butter, not overwhelming, but there's this great, it kind of goes between yep. kind of an almond and peanut butter. Uh, is that from the oats or what's, what do you think that's from? So, for more than likely it's from the oats, but it could also be kind of the unique yeast strains, et cetera. Yeah, um, it's still good. There's so many alternative things in there. So um, we propagate our own yeast. We actually, we, we split the fermentation in the two halves. So we do, uh, we have 1200 gallon fermenters. We do 600 gallons one day, 600 gallons a second day. And what we do is day one, we use a yeast that's actually our house yeast. We propagate ourselves and that pulls the grain to the forefront because mottos respect the grain and we want to hold on to the positive attributes of that grain, but then blend and balance it with the positive att attributes of uh, maturation. Uh, day two, we use a brandy yeast, which pulls some of that fruitiness to the forefront. Um, then we also, you know, no chill filtration there. Number two char oak barrel, which is a little different. So with a two char, you get a little more lignin. So you get like toasted coconut, toasted hazelnut, those sort of things that complement that fruitiness. Um, right. And always 53 gallon barrels are larger, never anything smaller. Now that creaminess is the oats. That's really right. where those oats come into play. Yeah. Uh, also, we don't really do any sour mashing at Spirits of French Lake, which is kind of interesting because we also don't sweet mash in a traditional way. So, right. uh, for example, with Sinclair, this is actually, you know, on a technical basis, we're actually lowering the pH of our mash with a little bit of citric acid, which gives a little bit of fruitiness to it. Versus, fruits uh, there too. Yeah. 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 We get a lot, I get a lot of uh, like apricot on the Lee Sinclair so as much fruit. as anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is. Yeah. It's really, I mean, it's one of those that's, it's not your typical bourbon, which that's what we love about this. You know, mm -hmm. it's a bourbon and has those not nice sweetness. But all the other realms this goes into, especially uh, being a four-year-old bourbon, this is very complex. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, there's. Yeah. I think there's a couple of notes in there too, Tom, that you may you might pick up on. Um, we kind of have, 
you know, in Scotland, they talk about the, the, the character of a distillery. And I think that we've figured out that we have a little bit of a character um, that I find pretty interesting. So on those for us, I always get a little like fresh baked bread, even like a, with yes. a little honey to it. Yeah. Um, but it's balanced alongside those those sweeter barrel driven flavors. Um, right. The other the other thing that I pick up on and a lot of people do on the on the flavor profile is and I think this has everything to do with our house yeast. I always get a little like uh, uh, mint or even eucalyptus sort of flavors. Um, kind of herbal. Yeah. 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 And they, they cross a lot of our products. They come across a lot of our products. And that has a lot to do with that yeast and the pot still as well. Um, and then also the blending process, because, you know, running a pot still, man, you don't you don't create consistency on a pot still. You manage it over time by blending your stocks. So right. you get into Lee Sinclair selections and almost always if you have, say, 20 barrels you'll find four unique profiles within those 20 barrels you have that kind of herbal thing that has that that menthol sort of thing uh you have a, a jasmine sort of profile which is really interesting you have an almost traditional kentucky bourbon profile with that big oak heaviness to it and then there's this one profile and this is the profile that makes lee sinclair for me and it's the rarest of the profiles that we have it's very like cinnamon all ceylon cinnamon almost uh for lack of any better word or better descriptor, it's almost that that sort of cinnamon breakfast cereal thing yeah. going on for it. So yeah, cinnamon breakfast cereal, kind of between that a cinnamon roll, as you yeah. said, bread. I got some of those nice pastry notes. I mean, it's a very mm -hmm. it it has sweet notes, but it's very elegant and just very refined and extremely interesting. People are already asking. I know a lot of these people are um, from Indiana, but are they? How, where, where can they find your spirits? Where, wherever they are, where, where can they get? Yeah. Those? So uh, there's, uh, I'll go through the short list because we're just now getting into multiple states. So Indiana right. Johnson Brothers is our is our distributor. So uh, right. you go to your local liquor store, tell them order through Johnson Brothers, they can get it in. Big Red Liquors has our stuff. They also brought in some single barrels. Uh, if you're in Kentucky, Heritage Wine and Spirits uh, is is where we're at. Um, you get over to uh, Missouri, um, that's Show Me Spirits. They have our stuff. Uh, you get down into Texas, uh, Liquor King, <laughs> Dallas, Fort Worth, full clip distribution. Liquor King, Dallas, Fort Worth. If you're ever in Texas, guys, this chain is crazy. They've bought like 18 barrels from us <laughs> so far from this year to next year. Nice. Uh, and they get some really cool, unique stuff. Getting ready to go into New Orleans. I don't know who the distributor there is yet. And getting ready to go into Missouri. Also, Sealbox.com. They carry, uh, they ship to like 30 plus states. Oh, great. Um, okay spiritshub.com i think they ship the two or three states so we're out there uh we're just trying to make a splash and that's the fun of being an independent amateur uh distillery is that you can kind of turn on a dime and um you can also thumb your nose at the industry a little bit here and there so that that makes it fun <laughs> for us and i put the website up there uh if you want to look and see where you can find uh their spirits spirits of french lick.com and then you mentioned seal box dot com too if you're i know a lot of people watch from uh, all across the country uh if you go to sealbox.com uh that's yet another place where you can find that they have the bourbons they have a lot of your spirits right yes yes they definitely do they they usually blake at sealbox will pick up a little bit of everything we do and in fact he's going to pick up uh a new single barrel of maddie gladden uh that he's going to have a hold of that we picked mm -hmm. out and then he's also picking up some cases of the new barrel aged absinthe that we're rolling out with so excellent yeah that absinthe that you uh well we will we'll try the other bourbon but i mean this has uh uh quite a, an interesting theme and you you mentioned i wanted to put a picture up for people that have not been to french lick i was going to put a picture up of this incredible dome uh because i'm actually able to share a picture here Very um cool. Of the of the dome, I believe I'm about to share the right picture. Okay, is that is does that have the is that too small? That's too yep. small. What did I get the <laughs> small one? It was huge when I had it a moment ago. All right, so if you do look really closely, maybe I can try that once again. But there is this really really large um, dome in um, French Lick, uh, two really large resorts. But this is still a, an amazingly large dome for um, for for the country, right? Man, it is a crazy beautiful place, uh, and and if you've never been to French Lick, definitely anybody that's listening, you need to come. There's there, it, it's a cool little retreat. You know, if you're if we're kind of equidistant between Louisville, St. Louis, you know, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, uh, 
we were we were at one time you know sort of the attraction to go to prior to the collapse of everything in the 1920s um and there's a lot of neat stuff that happens there you got the dome you got the hotel you got the casino you got indoor water park you got all kinds of hiking toka lake is gorgeous uh anything you can imagine if you like being outside and you like to get away from the town that's where it's at it's a little incredibly bit haunted picture of the there. yeah what's ha incredibly again, haunted what? town as well yeah very so. haunted uh, beautiful place and uh, such a cool thing that, that you guys are there uh, doing spirits um, really in a, a very special uh, town uh, for Indiana and really just for the Midwest. Um, it's great what you're doing. What a cool story behind uh, Lee Sinclair and this new absinthe. I mean, this, this was the news just out today on the absinthe. Is that what I saw on Instagram or is kind of the news just yeah. hit, right? Yeah, it just, just, just came out today. I actually, uh, <laughs> I took a picture of it yesterday. They mocked up a bottle yesterday and they're getting ready to put labels on, I hope tomorrow or Friday. So maybe if we're lucky Saturday, it will be available at the distillery. That's what, that's what we're planning on as of right now. Um, but we've been working on this for a while and I actually bottled this back in December uh, with the intent of having it out prior to now, but the, uh, the TTB being what it is and the way that they treat absinthe, yeah, there's a little frustration going on there for sure, but we finally figured it out. That's all that matters. So, um, so yeah, this is this is more of what we do. So, you know, the distilled spirits market, um, if you're a craft distiller, it's it's ready, fire, aim, right? So I'm passionate about everything I make. I love making stuff, and if they'd let me go hog wild, I'd just have at it, and we'd make a little bit of everything. I always kind of say we're the uh, – we are kind of the um, – pharmacopoeia of small distillers right so we got something for everybody it might not fix it they'll make you forget about it at least for a little while so this absinthe is an extension of our existing le bleu style absinthe that we already make at spirits of french lick but what we did is we took that absinthe we put it into a new american oak barrel same kind of barrels we use for our bourbon uh so number two char medium plus toast uh and it's set there for i think a little over two years um i didn't know of anybody else that was doing a new american oak absinthe like that this is a little lighter style of absinthe that's more designed for the American palate. So it's it's not going to be that heavy black licorice just punch you in the face. This is this is a little right. little more tame than that because the American palate has a hard time with that a lot of times. Um, but I'm a huge fan, as you can probably tell, I've, I've talked about ghosts and all that stuff. I'm a huge fan of the paranormal and the occult. And I'm a huge, huge Dan Aykroyd fan. And <laughs> sometimes <laughs> everything kind of comes together the right way. Uh, so Aykroyd obviously has uh, crystal head vodka that he filters through Herkimer diamonds. And then he says that that affects the flavor, not judging, <laughs> right. whatever it's Aykroyd. He can do whatever he wants. I don't care. Right. Uh, so we decided that we would filter this two year old barrel aged absent through amethyst. And we make no prescription as to whether that does anything to it whatsoever. Uh, as I posted today, that's uh, that's the gazelle for the customer to ride as hard and fast as they would like to wherever they would like to. Uh, it was really just done because I wanted to do it. And there was some symbology with Dionysus, et cetera, there. And and really, again, kind of thumbing our nose a little bit at the industry. So um, and everything that all the rare things and the ways that vodkas are going through diamonds, the the when you actually do filter this through, I mean, what is what does that actually look like? So I have a video up on my Facebook. I had to make a what I gave. I was picking on my uh, on my marketing lady, Julie Kasperzak, a lot uh, with this is we we do this thing where we both come up with ideas and, and I'll come to her with an idea and I'll say something and she'll look at me like I'm crazy. And then then that's where Ride the Gazelle came from, because I'll tell her, ride the gazelle, Julie, and just come along with me. Right. And then she's all about it. Um, but I had to make what I called the, the CFU. Right. So it's the uh, crystal filtration unit which sounds more complicated than it is. It's three uh, beer filtration sight glasses with screens in between them filled with amethyst um, and then laid in line on the hose and the pump and you just pump it through slowly. So it's, uh, you know, of course there's a little, little, little inner monologue prayer, whatever you want to call it that goes along with it on my end. But again, there's no prescription on anyone else's end for whatever that's worth. <laughs> and again, the name of the new absent is called, so this is uh, Fascination Street. One of the things that we're very right. fond of is uh, music inspires everything that we do. Right. Every whiskey we make has a playlist that inspired it. Uh, so this was named after one of my favorite bands, The Cure. Uh, they had a song called Fascination yes. Street, and that very much so inspired this. You know, when I hear that song, Fascination Street, 
I think absinthe. I don't know why, uh, but I certainly do. And this is this is interesting too, Tom. You may like this as a quick uh, aside. This is the other side of us, right? So we have the very serious, very historical driven side. And then we have this kind of snarky, have fun with it sort of side. So we've done another release before this. It was called Unpretentious, which was a high ride bourbon finished in a, a port cask, which was something I swore I would never do. Um, we did that as a limited thing and it sold out like crazy. And uh, it was it was also a little snarky. So it's a uh, real basic label, unpretentious, unpretentious. Uh, <laughs> right? And then instead of giving you tasting notes or anything of that nature, we, we just give you these uh, <laughs> these little asides. Um, just like on the absinthe, I believe, on the side Drink, of it. Enjoy. It says, yeah, it basically <laughs> says something about, um, you know, some people would ask, why, why would you? And we would reply, why wouldn't we? So. Right. No, I like I like the approach and I'm a fan of the cure, too. I can't wait to try uh, awesome. the new absinthe. The absinthe is, yeah, it's, it's something so, so unique and different. And and, that, and we, you know, there are distilleries taking it on. But again, it's something that not everyone is taking on. Um, again, for those of you just joining us, I know a lot of people have stayed. And thank you. We're going to try some more great spirits. You're watching Bourbon Blog Live. It's Alan Bishop, the alchemist at spirits of french lick if you have any questions for him ask away make sure you're following us already hopefully you already are on bourbonblanc.com forward slash live or make sure you like and follow uh where you are watching from because we've continued to grow this uh nightly show every almost every night for the last seven months since the pandemic and it's been a lot of fun having great people continue to join us i know we had a question from um donald snyder uh he wanted to know what are some of the biggest challenges with making so many different products. <laughs> keeping track of them. That's the big thing. Um, keeping track of the products and forgetting what we've made. I mean, the first two years, right? We didn't, we, everybody likes to think that they have a good road plan, but the first two years, you know, there'd be Tuesdays or Wednesdays or whatever, you know, the, the, kind of slow and you just kind of do, you kind of do what you do. So uh, I go through the warehouse now, or I go back and I look through um, whiskey systems, which is our software. And, uh, like, I don't even remember making that and nor do I know what the hell I'm going to do with it whenever it's ready to go somewhere. Um, that and then cleaning the stills out, you know, keeping, you know, if you're going to run absinthe or gin or aquavit, and you got to get them stills clean before you run any, any kind of bourbon or rye or anything of that nature. Um, those are the real big challenges. Now that said, uh, we have a lot of one-offs. We'll always do some one-offs here and there, but you know, we're primarily driven by, being a bottled and bond product, that's where we've always wanted to get to. That's where we're at now. So the focus is a little more linear than what it was when we started because we have we have to meet you know all the quotas for each of the individual seasonal products. Uh, so I don't get two or three days a week to be like, oh, what happens if I throw this wine lees in the still and run it through as like a grappa or you know something of that nature. So uh, it's getting a little easier to track now, um, and it's becoming a little clearer. I was actually telling somebody today, Tom, you might get a kick out of this. Um, Gave somebody a tour, and of course, I get done with a tour, and I've done it so many times, it sounds like I really knew what I was doing when I started there. And the truth of the matter is, it was all luck. I didn't have any idea how any of this stuff was going to work out in the long run. So, it's a, it's a lot. So, how many products is it that you have on your, um, that you do? What a few is Man, it? counting the one offs, I probably, there's probably 15 or 16 right now, but like the mainline huh. products, um, the Lee, the Maddie, the apple brandy, uh, there will be a rye whiskey, there's a weeded whiskey or weeded bourbon, uh, and then a buckwheat bourbon, and then the clear products, absinthe, gin, and aquavit. So about nine real kind of hardcore things that we stick with. Nice. You're doing, some, you're doing great work. Uh, Amanda Howard is, is sending you a, sh a shout out there saying he knows his liquor. He sure does. And uh, Kent Mace as well sending you a shout out. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Aaron Hardeman from YouTube has a question. Are there other heirloom grains that you would like to experiment with that you that you haven't already experimented with? Oh, certainly, yeah. Um, there's uh, certainly some old uh, types of barley and wheat in particular. There are some heirloom rye I would like to be able to track down and do something with. Uh, we will play around with other corn varieties yet. We do have a corn variety that I worked on for 15 years. Uh, that we do run a heirloom bourbon out of that is not quite out yet, but uh, that's a cross of 150 different open pollinated corns. Um, 
We've done some high cartonoid orange corn, which gives a lot of like safflower flavors. Uh, there's certainly a number of grains that are kind of on the radar for one-offs and things of that nature. Um, you know, I, I spent years before I started distilling professionally here on the tobacco farm, we converted it to a basically an organic produce farm. And so I really was using that as a chance to breed or try to breed new and interesting open pollinated varieties. And that's kind of what drove me further into distillation because once you breed them, what, what the hell do you do with them? At the time, nobody in Ohio Valley cared. So, you know, you got to still run that corn through it and see if that corn tastes any different. So that's always, always going to drive what we do because distilling is agricultural. Also, uh, Amanda Howard, who was just on, she, she comes from a line of, uh, of old school Kentucky moonshiners as well. So. Oh, wow. Very nice. It's, it's so cool to see, uh, so many great fans of yours watching. Um, why don't we try a little of the Matty Glenn? I have some of this brandy as well. We'll try, but, um, this is now these are, these are both so good. I'm already sipping on the Matty Glenn. Um, excellent. Again, another character there. Uh, both, both of these are bottle and bond, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They sure are. All of these yeah. are uh, bottle and bond. This is this is uh, so cool to have two bottle and bonds that you just released. Uh, tell us about uh, Matty Gladden. Will do. So first off, on the on the bourbons and the rise uh, in yes. the future, every everything that we come out with that's mainline from this point forward will always be bottled and bond. That's that's been my goal since I started, and I want to keep heading that direction. I okay. think that craft distillers right. need to need to be there. We need to focus on that. Um, it's a real distinction of at least uh, putting some effort into something, right? So right. Um, that's definitely the goal. But the Matty Gladden is interesting. It's uh, it's another kind of alternative mash bill. Uh, definitely a high rye, so 55 corn, 35 rye, 10 malt. Um, Four Roses, you know, has a mash bill very similar to that. Um, now, I'm going to say this up front, too, because it's interesting before I get into the sort of tasting notes and all that stuff with you, plus the history. When we first made this and it came off that pot still, Tom, I hated it. I thought it was terrible. Yeah, for the, yeah, for the first two years that we made it, I didn't know what the hell we were going to do with it. And then it hit year three, and I'm like, there's something going on here. And to be honest with you, this is the first time I've ever made a product where I was like 95%. Like, okay, you might actually know what the hell you're doing at this point in time. So, um, but Again, double pot distilled, two different distinct yeast strains, no chill filtration, number two charred oak barrels, 53 gallon or larger. Um, Maddie is an interesting character, and the whiskey had to be interesting to fit that character. Sometimes we have a character in mind when we make a whiskey. Sometimes we find the character after we taste the whiskey and we go, that, that makes a lot of sense. So Maddie, and, and I got to tell the story because you'll love this. Maddie was originally from Salem, Indiana. When she was about 15 years old, uh, after her father died, she went to work for Lee Sinclair as a housekeeper. So they're interrelated there. Um, we now know that she basically fell in love with, for better or worse at that time, one of Lee Sinclair's housekeepers. They took off to Tennessee. No word on whether or not Lee was going to kill him or what was going to happen there, but they took off. She ends up in Tennessee and either through divorce or the first husband's death, we don't know for sure. Uh, she did have a, a son with that first husband, by the way. Uh, she ends up remarried, and then all these rumors start coming back into Little Salem, Indiana, which is at the time a conservative railroad town, still a very conservative town, um, that she is a madam at two prominent brothels, one in uh, Chattanooga and one in Nashville. Somewhere during this time period, she meets celebrated showman P.T. Barnum, and legend has it that P.T. Barnum, when she decided that she was going to retire from this profession, because she had a degenerative disease called Bright's disease and her son also had Bright's disease. So she's going to quit to try to take care of him. PT Barnum gives her a cash gift because she was his favorite. Uh, as, as a gentleman here in town used to say, Buster Crockett to every, every woman that ever talked to him, she's my favorite, <laughs> but he, uh, she comes back up to Salem, Indiana. She starts building this magnificent queen Anne style Victorian house on main street. The rumors follow her. All the ladies in the town are angry. They're afraid she's going to start a brothel. Uh, she she has married a new gentleman named Percy Gladden, who is from New York. A uh, little bit of a sleaze ball in a lot of ways. He sort of he ran a couple of the uh, the first movie houses in Salem and a lot of the taverns. Kind of a violent gentleman. Um, on his marriage certificate to her, he described himself as a cowboy, whatever that means when you're from New York. 
Um, she gets the house built. No sooner than she builds it, she opens a brothel. Uh, and she's sort of catering this to traveling Chicago businessmen coming in on the railroad, stopping on their way to Louisville. Um, the long and short of it is every day at, at about three o'clock, she would go down to the train station and she would hand out uh, business cards for her brothel to the local businessmen to try to bring them in. And at that time, a brothel wasn't exactly what you might think of it now. Uh, everything probably obviously ended in, in sex. But Maddie Gladden had four women who worked for her. Uh, and those four women, she expected to be highly educated. And they all had to know how to play the harpsichord. Because you're not just coming there for that one reason. You're coming there for entertainment for the evening. That's the whole goal of the, the entire thing. Um, she was always known to be dressed to the nines. She wore all black. She wore a big hat. She was just covered in diamonds and pearls. Uh, we have a story of a young girl who actually saw her uh, when she was a kid in an alleyway uh, at three o'clock in the afternoon. All the parents and or all the ladies in the uh, town would make all the kids go back in the house so they didn't see Maddie because it's inappropriate, right? So this little girl stayed out in the alleyway and hid behind some bushes so she could see Maddie. And as Maddie came walking down the alleyway, this little girl never seen anybody like this before. She stood up, her mouth, you know, drops open, whatever. Maddie sees her and walks over and kind of pats her on the head, pinches her cheek and says, well, aren't you such a cute little thing? And unfortunately for the little girl, her mother also saw this. So she uh, got drugged back to the house by her ear and made to take a bath at three o'clock in the afternoon, went to bed without supper at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but Maddie, they had no real laws about brothels in Salem. So Maddie ran the, the brothel for about six years before they finally started implementing more and more sort of things to kind of bring her under control. Uh, but Maddie was a, definitely a rebel. So even after she closed the business down, uh, you know, she was very angry at the women of Salem for this. Of course, they thought that, you know, the local men were going in. Probably there were. There was kind of a back staircase out of the house. Um, right. But the long and short of it is she goes and buys these nude Grecian statues. She puts them up in the window of the parlor. Uh, and she basically says, you know, how can these women, these refined high class women, uh, you know, be offended by art. So she also then makes it a point to make sure that she's in every parade the town ever has from that point forward alongside one of her girls. Uh, her and Percy get divorced about a year after the, their divorce. Percy comes back into town from Chicago. He's drunk. He tries to break into the house. She shoots him in the face, <laughs> in the left cheek uh, from the bathroom window. He doesn't die. He lives through it shortly thereafter. They're married again. So she had something going on for her. Uh, she's married one last time after that uh, to a local gentleman, a local successful farmer. They both sort of agree uh, to prenups because they don't need the money and they want their stuff to go back to their respective families. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting story. If you're going to have a spicy high rye bourbon and you're going to name it after a woman for sure, you want that right kind of woman that could have stood right up there next to any male and put them in their place. And she certainly did that with Percy. And we certainly think that the bourbon itself can do that against uh, anything you put it up against in the same age range. This is this is quite a story. And um, a, a, this is what makes part of this. The, the whiskey is so good. The spirits are so good. And the stories behind these are so, so unique and interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I enjoy all of them. So they have to represent one another back and forth yeah. for sure. You know, you can't have yeah, one do. without the other. And. Let me tell you too, Tom, Jolie Kasperzak, the, uh, the marketing VP, she's responsible for these gorgeous labels. Uh, right. She has done Great a fantastic label. job yeah. on those. Um, and and there's there's more coming. We've got more characters coming. we got a, a, a Solomon Scott Rye whiskey, which is coming up. Gentleman who was from Paley, Indiana, owned several distilleries and became a prominent bootlegger. To this day, family still uh, think of him as almost a saint because – he was providing moonshine during the Spanish flu epidemic when none of the doctors would come and visit them. And they say that he saved a lot of their lives. William Dalton's our weeded bourbon that'll be out in January, uh, named after the longest uh, tenured distiller in Indiana history. William Dalton at Daisy Spring Distillery, now Spring Mill State Park. Amazing. And and these ladies had to all play the harpsichord too. It helped it helped the evening go yep. on longer. But right. The question say, is, if they, they could have had this bottle of bourbon, would the evening have been gone even longer? It could have. It's possible. It could have. It could. It could have, it or have. it may. It may never have started. It may <laughs> never know? have started. Right. Right. <laughs> may have just been a lot of guys passed out on the sidewalk with with Might intentions of making it there. So the harpsichord we, uh, sure helped. Right. So we have a, a set of videos coming up too, Tom. That that's really neat. Uh, Bo Cumberland got with us. We just did some for Lee Sinclair on the history of that. 
but we have this really cool video that we recorded at the Maddie Gladden house where we had a girl come in and play the ghost of Maddie Gladden. And that's coming out in the next couple of weeks, right in time for Halloween. Incredible. And, and an incredible bourbon. I mean, the, the flavors in this one are, it's very different than the last, but also just very, uh, just, just a lot of complexity, uh, a lot of great sweetness. Uh, what do you get on this one? I mean, I see some spice in here. This is, this is really good. Mm -hmm. So on the, on the aroma on this one, I, again, that fresh baked bread is always apparent to me on all of our products. Yeah. Um, but I get a little anise. I get a little kind of green apple and maybe a little of that yeah. black cherry stone fruit sort of thing. Um, I was getting a little clove, really, too, that anise and kind of yes. clove almost too. Yeah. yeah. Um, the thing that I love about the Maddie Gladden is, uh, so, you, you know, with Lee Sinclair, you had that creamy sort of mouthfeel. With this, you have the same thing, but it's, it's, a, little more, it's a little more oily. So you'll notice when you, when you finish, this strange thing kind of happens where you get the finish. It comes back, but it's not at the back of the palate. It's at the mid palate. And what that is is where we very specifically cut a little bit into what would normally be called the tails to get those oils. And so what happens is when you drink that, it coats your palate. Your saliva actually starts to break that down enzymatically, and it comes back to the forefront. It's almost to me, it's almost like a magic trick, but I love it. But on the taste, I get that Good. eucalyptus. Um, I get some molasses. I get clove and ginger, um, and a slight little citrus, and maybe a little like grains of paradise um, uh, or, or you know black pepper, if black pepper were a little more linear, I guess you would say. Um, definitely on that finish, I start to get that pepper. I start to get a little bit of that tobacco leaf thing going on and then yeah. almost like a mint cream sort of thing. Oh yeah, that it's, I mean, it's extremely, the, the arcs this has all the way through are extremely mm -hmm. interesting, complex. Um, again, at four years old, this has so much going on. How do you make these? I mean, to me, these taste so much older. What's, what do you attribute that to? A lot of it, I think, was growing up in a family of distillers. But the, f and really more than anything, Tom, to be honest with you, I think it's luck. Um, but the one thing I think that I had for me is like my dad and my grandpa, they wouldn't tell me how to do anything. They refused to tell me how to do anything. So I never had anybody tell me how to make anything, um, which means I learned about 3,000 ways not to make whiskey and one or two ways that actually seemed to work for me. Uh, but yeah. I would attribute attribute it as much as anything to the pot still and to having a good team that works alongside me. Um, but that pot still bring that full body thing, uh, you know, that big round, heavy distillate um, 53 gallon barrels. Again, I think that has a lot to do with it and being able to make good, solid cuts and understand, you know, if you're not going to be in the barrel that long, you make a very clean cut. If you're going to go in the barrel a little longer, you leave a little heads, you leave a little tails, you leave a little of those fractions that people normally say that you wouldn't. It's not as black and white as you get on distillery tours, obviously. Um, but a lot of it, honestly, is is intuition and luck. That's really more of it than anything. Well, you you have some you have some great luck and intuition, and I know you have a lot of a lot of talent with this. These are uh, delicious, and again, for those of you just joining us. It is, uh, it's Bourbon Blog Live. I see some, just so many great people joining us. We do this almost every night um, around 8 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you like that link. Uh, follow Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you are. And also, I just want to tell everybody, uh, because I'm usually on the road hosting whiskey tastings across the country, um, we do something similar to this, but we have a really small group. We get to ask questions, and it's called Bourbon Blog at Home. Please, uh, Please bookmark that. Check it out in the next few weeks. We're going to be doing some um, chocolate pairings, some Halloween candy pairing, a lot of fun uh, virtual tastings we'll do with you at home. So be sure you check that out too. Um, and so many people I see joining us that are um, big fans of the whiskey. Uh, Benjamin Eve says it's absolutely uh, killer whiskey. Um, we had a couple other questions. I want to make sure there's been so many good questions coming in here for you. Uh, Alan, but I want to make sure we, uh, yeah. get, oh, Patrick, Patrick, uh, is it Patrick Bologna says, talk about your barrel storage. Yeah. So we have kind of two very unique, uh, warehouses. So the first one's what we call the barrel chai, and it's a little more like a, uh, brandy cellar. So it's attached to the main distillery. It's not actively heated or cooled. It's just passive. Uh, we age on wine racks that are four high, real good ventilation in there, um, but it's not, you don't get huge swings in temperature. So 30 to 40 degree differential throughout the year. And that plays a lot into the fruitiness 
and the volatility. So pot stills are all about retention and concentration of flavor. Uh, our motto, again, respect the grain. It's a blend and balance idea. So the idea is that each grain has its own unique flavor and that the pot still will then capture that. The blend and balance idea is basically that, you know, as opposed to a Kentucky distiller where they might say 60 to 70 percent of their profiles come from the barrel. We want 50 50, 50 percent raw material, fermentation and distillation, 50 percent maturation. So that even if I come out with a 12 year old bourbon, if I'm going to put that mash bill on there and it has unique grains in it, you should still be able to taste the positive attributes of each of those unique grains uh, alongside the wood, alongside the maturation. So this particular warehouse, the chai cellar, uh, 30, 40 degree differential throughout the year, not real high, not real low, very high humidity, uh, crazy high angel share. It's actually enough angel share. I probably get fired from anywhere else for doing this. It's about 7% a year, but that also gives us that retention, that concentration of flavor alongside that with the number two chart oak barrel we talked about earlier. We do very low entry proof on all the bourbons. They all go in at 105. Mm -hmm. uh, you go in at 105, you got more water and ethanol. Water is a be better solvent on wood than ethanol is. Uh, so you break down more lignin over time. You micro oxidize a little, a little differently. You don't age quicker. You just age very differently. So anything with oats, uh, anything with kasha or buckwheat and all the brandies are always in that chai cellar. The other warehouse is a lot more like a Scottish style dunnage. So uh, big red barn, ventilation all the way around, barrels again, four high, high temperature, maybe 110, 115, low temperature, however cold it is outside. Um, concrete floor as opposed to a dirt floor. Uh, but that is really there for products with a lot of rye. Uh, so the Matty Gladden, the rye whiskey both end up over there. And anything with more than, say, 70% corn. Uh, so the heirloom bourbon ends up over there. And then we also have, and this might be breaking news too, Tom, I, I, and it won't be out for another year, but still kind of cool. Uh, we have a chocolate malt corn whiskey that's setting over there that's going to come out as bottled and bond eventually. Um, Chocolate so, malt. So what would that, so how does, what does that look like? Chocolate malt corn, chocolate malt yeah, corn whiskey. So, so it's, it's 90% corn, 10% uh, brewer's malt, which is a chocolate malt that's been roasted to like a, a coffee like color. Uh, and it has a lot of those mocha sort of tones to it. Um, and so the idea was that, you know, we like to reuse barrels for a lot of different products. We make so many different things, but we, we never make enough of those things to reuse almost all of our barrels. So we knew we wanted to make a corn whiskey. We know we're not going to compete with mellow corn, right? Mellow corn's great for right. what it is. So if you're going to do it, do it different. Throw a little chocolate malt in there. Bring a little different aspect to it. Hopefully bring some uh, some mixologists to it. You know, hopefully by then the bars are back open. Oh, if yeah. not, home yeah. mixology being what it is, you know, it's it's going to be cool. It's going to be something very, very different for the people. So That sounds really good. What, and that's probably one of the first chocolate malt corn whiskeys I've heard of. I mean, that's... Is that pretty you can new tell, corn whiskey? It is. You can tell that I'm at my house and my wife is currently cooking with a skillet because the, the, the smoke detector just went <laughs> off. So she is she <laughs> throwing a little whiskey into the into tonight's dish, or what do you think? She she may have. You never know. Yeah, I didn't hear any cussing or screaming, so we're good. <laughs> but yeah, I think chocolate malt's fairly new to this. I know there's some there's uh there's some bourbons that are using some chocolate malts. I think um I believe that that Veach, Mike Veach did one uh, maybe down at Kentucky Artisan. It hasn't come out yet, but I don't remember what the exact mash bill is on it. But as far as corn whiskey variations, short of the moonshine world, I don't I don't see a whole lot of corn whiskey variations out there. Right, it's something you you just see kind of done the re the regular way. This is very exciting, and that'll be next year. We'll be seeing that. Yep, yep. It should be late next year. I think we'll we'll have a very small batch of bottled and bond. Then the year after that, it'll become a regular product. Okay, excellent. You know, uh, just one of the things you know, we think about um, Kentucky bourbon. Obviously, has made such a um, such a place in our hearts and and in the bourbon world for you know being that can, we know what Kentucky bourbon is. When people look to Indiana bourbon, or when you look to the future of Indiana bourbon, what do you hope that will look like for um, you know whether it's not exactly Indiana versus Kentucky bourbon, but what do you, what do you hope that Indiana bourbon is known for? Yeah, so I, I think there's certainly a history of it there, and, and, and we can talk about that alongside the apple brandy too. But, uh, you know, sure, bourbon has existed in Indiana, in southern Indiana in particular, for almost as long as it did in Kentucky. The first distiller that we know of in Indiana that was making what we would now recognize as bourbon was a man named John Fleener just north of Salem, Indiana in 1806. Um, so it, it certainly existed for a long time. You know, 
we say again Hoosier occupied Northern Kentucky because it's the same culture on both sides of the river in a lot of ways. Uh, we were on an aquifer, you know, limestone, same minerals, same pH in our water, same culture, just like they are in Kentucky. And so I think to look to the future, you have to look to the past and realize how big the distilling complex is or was in southern Indiana. The fact that it was destroyed really by prohibition more than anything else, actually two episodes of prohibition in Indiana, one from 1853 to 1855 and then national prohibition. Um, and I think that what really needs to happen, and, and I'm not in any place to give any other craft distiller any advice whatsoever, but I think what really needs to happen, I think what's going to set not just us in Indiana apart, but also craft distillers in every state apart is don't try to do what the big guys are doing. Right. They make good stuff. They're incredibly adept at it. You are never going to beat them at making what they make. And there is no reason for you to. There is enough out there, enough old timey things and enough new innovative things uh, that there's no reason you can't set yourself apart and make something really great. But it's going to require a lot of education on the distillers. We have to put that out there uh, and educate the consumer. And, you know, like I said earlier, we're not doing anything new. We're doing things that farm distillers were doing in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. It's yes. just been forgot about. Um, so I hope that for us at Spirits of French Lake, this has always been my goal. And it's, it's a little odd goal. And if you talk to the owners, you talk to the marketing uh, lady, they may say something different. But for me as a distiller, my goal and how I know that we have success, and I believe then customers follow this, we want to be one of the handful of craft distilleries that other craft distillers want to come to and come hang out and talk and see what you're doing. Um, to me, that's, that's as important as anything else is, is having other of your peers look at you and go, that's cool. What are you doing? And let's talk about it. So, right. um, yeah. That's incredible. You're doing, you're doing great work. It's a great, uh, things to look forward to for the future and, and it's already happening for you and and we're going to try this hoosier apple brandy the old clifty hoosier mm -hmm. apple brandy yes so this is a, a little different style of apple brandy so my family again having the distilling background we made more apple brandy than we made whiskey or moonshine mm -hmm. um, you know every everybody in the country has an apple tree in their yard or two apple trees and some people don't use any off of them the people that do they use them once or twice a year and the rest of them go to waste so free material to distill with, right? But the long and short is it ties heavily into Indiana's distilling history, and it's a very unique style. It has nothing in common with Calvados. Our apple brandy is more like um, if bourbon had a mistress, I guess you would say. <laughs> yes. So right. it's very, very similar to bourbon in tonality. It's very it big. Is. It's very heavy bodied. You're not going to get that huge fruit pop. And listen, if you're getting that huge fruit pop from a brandy, most of the time it's because they're adding artificial flavors or things of that nature. Uh, this is this is made for people who are bourbon drinkers that are really into bourbon. If you're buying 12 to 24 bottles a year or more, you know, no judgment here. But we're not going to get you to switch to apple brandy. I know that. It doesn't have to happen. It's not necessarily a mainline product for us. What I want is for one month out of the year, for you to buy a bottle of apple brandy and go, hey, I get it. This is really good. It's an easy transition. I yes. certainly think it's a much easier transition than a lot of the rums that are out there that everyone talks about, um, with some exceptions, obviously. Um, but for us, it's a it's a piece of the history too, Tom. So uh, the the distilling region that we're in is what was at one point in time called the Black Forest of Southern Indiana. Uh, so it's Orange, Washington, uh, Crawford, Harrison, Perry, and Lawrence counties. And in that Black Forest region between 1855 and 1914, there were 155 legal apple brandy distilleries, making between three and 1,200 barrels a year, which doesn't sound like much. But if you break it down in brandy perspective, you're talking one to three bushels of apples to make one gallon of brandy. Uh, so these guys from August every year to January every year just running like crazy to get that done. Um, they always made this bigger, heavier style of brandy. Uh, and between 1855 and 1914, that six county region was actually the largest producer in the entire world of apple brandy. And it was world renowned as a very specific style of apple brandy um, that was considered very high quality. So we are currently the only operating distillery within the Black Forest. Um, we are definitely the only legal distillery to make a Hoosier apple brandy in the Black Forest in over 114 years, uh, roughly. 
Um, so it's super important to us to get back into those things. Now on the bottle, what's cool, the old Clifty, that was actually an old brand. Um, old Clifty was a distillery that was located just north of Campbellsburg, Indiana, in this beautiful box canyon called um, Cave River Valley. Uh, and that's so it. it right there. Yeah, that's the mill well, and the distillery right next to it. So they made uh, about 20,000 gallons a year, which doesn't sound like a lot, but again, I broke it down for you. And back in the day, if you wanted the Primo Apple Brandy, that's what you wanted was Old Clifty. Um, and it just faded into obscurity. Uh, but that was one of the longest running distilleries in Southern Indiana, had multiple owners. The main owner through most of the time was a gentleman named Henry Robertson. Prior to him, uh, the gentleman, uh, the, uh, Hamer and Hammersley, uh, Hammersley famous from Spring Mill State Park uh, history, uh, actually were the owner and the distiller there previous to him. But Robertson was interesting. He was um, he planted huge orchards all around the Box Canyon, uh, and he had this huge flume built off this Box Canyon cliff because there was no good road into the valley back in the day. So you'd have to bring your apple cart in, you drop your apples off, you throw them down this flume, and they'd land in this big box where he'd get them for distilling. We actually have a record of a, a kid falling down that at the 4th of July celebration one time, and he lived through it. He oh lived through God. it and didn't, he just got skinned up, didn't really get hurt. But <laughs> if you ever go look at the cliff where that flume was at, you go, that I don't know how he fell down that and didn't die. Um, so one of the other things we do, Tom, you, you may or may not find this interesting, but when we do these tributes to people or places, we never sell bottles one through three, and we don't keep bottles one through three. Those bottles go to the place or to the people or to reenactors of those people. So oh, Lee wow. Sinclair, in his uh, in his mausoleum, he's got bottle number one of the Lee Sinclair bourbon. Maddie Gladden, she we poured out bottle number one for her. Bottle number two is actually in the house in an old safe that she had underneath oh, the stairs. Wow. Um the Old Clifty bottle number one got poured out at Old Clifty. Um, and then we left the empty bottle there and had kind of a scavenger hunt where we told people that we'd left it there and whoever got there first got a free tour. Because <laughs> it's a hell of a hike to get down there and back. So anybody went and got a bottle, they're getting a free tour and they're getting a free bottle when they come see me, you know. So so you hid um, the bottle. Well, I didn't hide it. I left it out in the open because I <laughs> because I knew that um, – I knew that it was it was going to take somebody that actually wanted to come take a tour, to go hike down there to go get it. You know what I mean? So, um, but and then when they came to visit me, they got the free tour and I gave them a free bottle then. So all they got when they went to Old Clifty was just the empty bottle number one. So, but uh, yeah. This is such a great uh, brandy. I mean, this is so nice. As you said, um, a lot of bourbon flavors, the barrel you get, but you also get that the, the autumnal notes. I mean, this is the perfect time of yes. year to drink this, uh, whether it's by itself. I'm sure, are there cocktails you'd like to do that with this one yourself? Or There are a ton. Um, it's actually really good in old fashions, but I'll tell you the easiest one yes. that I love, if you can get some fresh cider, heat it up in a mug, throw about mm. an ounce of that in there, and then throw just a little cinnamon and a little butter. Just a little butter, not much. Just give it some, some oil butter. and some mouthfeel. It's delicious, man. It, it gets you in trouble real quick. <laughs> no, it's it's so approachable. It's so smooth. Uh, Benjamin's telling us that he likes it in an old fashioned with fifty percent um, your apple brandy, fifty percent rye. So uh, there's already some fans yep. of this all over, and uh, these are all great spirits. Thank you so much yeah. for uh, for the chance to talk to you tonight, Alan Bishop on uh, Bourbon Blog Live here, the Alchemist at the Spirits of French Lick. Um, some great things coming that uh, Absinthe, again, will be coming. Is it this weekend it will be out for sale? It'll be sad. I, actually, when I was talking to you momentarily, Jolie blew up yeah. my phone to tell me it will be out Saturday. So she It'll has, be out Saturday. She, she has made a decree. Saturday it is. Yes, I saw her watching. Thank you, Jolie, for watching. We appreciate it. And um, if you're wanting to learn more about Spirits of French Lick, check out that website, spiritsoffrenchlick.com. If you're wanting to order from outside the area, to get shipped to you, sealbox.com. You said ships to about 30 states. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, as a quick aside, uh, if you're interested in the history of distilling in Indiana, alchemistcabinet.wordpress.com. I do a lot of writing there. And uh, be on the lookout over probably, let's say, the next 12 months. I've been working on a documentary uh, with a very good friend of mine, DJ Henderson, about the history of distilling in southern Indiana. And I hope to have something done with that by late next year. That's cool. So we might be seeing a we'll be seeing a documentary from you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is very cool. Very cool. 
Thanks, Alan. Uh, such a great pleasure to have you. Hopefully, we'll get over to uh, French Lick soon and see you and sip some of your um, more of your whiskey and some of your absinthe. I look forward to trying yes, that. Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll get in there and drill some of those individual barrels and show you some really neat stuff we got put back. So come on over, man. Look forward to it, my friend. Thanks so much. So many great people joining us tonight. Uh, you can go back and watch this on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter if you just joined us recently. Or the uh, audio will be up on our podcast, which is right there. So make sure you uh, sign up for our podcast. Subscribe to our podcast there on anchor.fm forward slash bourbon blog. Alan, great work with everything you're doing. You're very talented, my friend. Cheers. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Absolutely, my friend. Thanks so much.